So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our clergy conversations at St. Paul's Chestnut Hill. We are celebrating the blessed Absalom Jones uh, this weekend. So uh, we are honored to share the city that uh, nurtured him and uh, that he led as a theologian and as a healer and as a priest of the Episcopal Church. And so we are also honored today to have Denise Jones. Uh, jo are you related to Absalom? Maybe you are. I don't know. You know, I guess I'd have to do a, a significant DNA test to determine exactly, you know, from which part of Africa we came. So I don't know. I'm, there, there could be some DNA cross pollination there. We're but all from Africa. You know that. Everybody. I do know that. I We're do know that. Africa. We are children of Eve from yes. East Africa. That we we can prove that genetically. Yep. Yeah. So let me begin, Denise. Thank you first of all for for sure. being part of this and. And I think it's a great way for the congregation to get to know you. But one of our kind of quieter but very significant congregations is the eight o'clock congregation. And most people don't want to get up that early. But you are a very faithful member of the eight o'clock congregation. And I really miss that morning time, that lovely light in the church. And hopefully after Easter, we can, with vestry approval, we can start up again and be able to meet together. But can you tell us what is it that you love about that eight o'clock service? Sure. Thank you, first of all, Albert, for having me. Um, let's talk about the eight o'clock. I have always been an early riser. You know, the morning is what gives me joy. And so I choose to worship at that time of day. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful, pensive, thoughtful time, I think, to come in communion with my fellow saints, so to speak, as well as to, to worship. Spoken word is important to me, and that's a spoken word ceremony for all intents and purposes. And, you know, I think most of us understand the Bible. We know the Bible. We have favorite scriptures. But I find the lyrical aspect of the Bible to be most present at that eight o'clock service. And by the way, if Betty comes by, there she is, you got an ear. Okay, Hi, Betty. <laughs> Little 16 year old Betty. But yeah, it's just a quiet, beautiful time. And it gets me off to a great start for my Sunday. Mm -mm, so wonderful. that's why I like the eight o'clock, yeah. That's wonderful. So tell us a little bit about, I noticed that wonderful photograph behind Betty there is uh, your family and that's your spiritual roots. Tell us about your spiritual journey. Okay. So, you know, I had to do a little bit of homework to make sure I'm, I'm quoting time accurately. So um, my faith is rooted in the Baptist denomination. And this is what that photograph represents. I think you'll see a little reflection. Um, but I was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. All of my family are Baptist. My ancestral church is Morning Star Baptist Church, which is noted in this 1934 photograph. My father's family, my mother's family, all were founding members of the church. I gotta hold on one second. Oh my gosh, girl, you got to go, Betty. You gotta move. Okay. So yeah, so that's, the, that's where my family started. So all my relatives were Baptists and continue to be Baptists. My mother and I are the only Episcopalians. So mom and I left Mississippi when I was a baby. I was baptized an Episcopalian in Georgia. My mother was teaching at a historically black college called Fort Valley State College. And it is in that city that I became an Episcopalian. The thing is, I still was deeply rooted in the Baptist faith because I would go home during the summers and become a Baptist for two months. So I am there. When people say, well, what are you? At the end of the day, I will say, I am a Christian. That's the short answer. The long wind up answer is what I just gave you about the Baptist part of my heart as well as the Episcopalian part of my heart. So I did a little research again amongst my stuff I'm hardcore Episcopalian. I found a little medallion my mother gave me when I was confirmed. I was confirmed March 7th, 1965 in Milford, Connecticut. 
I was a member of the Girls Friendly Society. I went to Girls Friendly Camp. So yeah, hardcore Episcopalian girl. <laughs> That's great. And how did you find St. Paul's? Process of elimination. So I've been in the Philadelphia area for around 27, 28 years. I moved to Ardmore initially and I attended St. Mary's Church in Ardmore, a beautiful, sweet, welcoming little community of faith. Rent was going, getting high and I said, look, you need to buy a house. So someone had told me about Chestnut Hill. I didn't know anything about Chestnut Hill, but I knew it was you know, one of the better places to be. Purchased a house over here in uh, Upper East Mount Airy, and I started visiting churches. I went to several in the area, and we all know our friends and neighbors, but nothing resonated with me. I just didn't feel what I expected to feel in looking for a church. So I started visiting St. Paul's maybe every, uh, every month or every six weeks, and Cliff was still there. So I would go to the eight o'clock service worship and come on back. And I will tell you one thing that I was looking to hear, which I did hear, was what does this church do in the community? The announcements are meaningful to me. When we read those announcements around what's going on in the community, it's like, okay, so they're doing a little something here. Um, yeah, so that's what led me. And I finally decided to just make this my home. And I just started attending, reg attending regularly. That's wonderful. I know you, you, you and I have talked about Barbara Harris and Barbara preached when, you know, Cliff um, yeah. retired. Okay. What, what does Barbara Harris mean to you? So, you know, feminism is interesting. My mother was a feminist. My grandmother was a feminist. You know, all strong women are rooted somewhere in feminism. But the notion of feminism morphing into a more corporate um, business strain happened in the 70s, right? So when I came out of college, uh, women were getting management jobs in the workplace. Things were really starting to happen. And of course, may she rest in peace. Um, Helen Reddy sang, I am woman, hear me roar. Not too long after that song hit the number one charts, here we have what, 1988, and Barbara Harris was ordained a bishop. That was big news on many fronts, not just for Episcopalians. And the fact that she was black compounded the grandeur of that time. So yeah, it's like, well, look at her, good for you. Very, very proud time for me as a woman, as well as an Episcopalian. And, and so tell us about what do you think has been some of the most memorable things that have changed over the years for you as an Episcopalian? I think that that is one of them. You know, that is one of them. Interesting, you know, churches vary, congregations vary. I think that amongst all faiths, a desire to understand what is going on into the, in the world and to insert ourselves into that dialogue is something. Now, I really have to caveat that because in the South, the Black Baptist Church was always in tune, specifically in the 60s during the civil rights era. And again, in the North, you know, a lot of the freedom riders came from churches that were more liberal. But I think, you know, that expansion of thought and desire to know, but more so desire to be an agent of change. That is what I'm saying. Appreciating a, a struggle is one thing, but willing to be a part of it actively is another. Mm -hmm. Good point, good point. And so speaking of being active, so you have found yourself now on the rector search committee at St. Paul's. And I remember when we did the commissioning and we put objects in the ark, I forgot what you put in the ark. So can you tell me what, um, what are you learning from that process? You guys meet every Tuesday night. Um, it's a huge commitment and thank you for doing that on behalf of the whole parish. But so what was the object that you put in the ark and what are you learning about the process? 
So I got to be honest with you, can't remember what I put in the ark. I know I put my goodwill in that ark for us finding a rector in due season and in due time, as the Bible says. But I don't remember what I put in the ark, but I can talk to you about the committee. First of all, I value these people tremendously. We are a we are becoming quite the tight knit group. Um, you know, I appreciate the fact that we have one of our teammates who is putting everything up there on base camp. We are starting to get quite a few applications in. Um, so we are we are in our busy season, so to speak. But what I appreciate about the process personally is I'm getting to know folks I never saw. I didn't know these people before. Um, so now I'm knowing who they are and I, I feel I can call them friends, but also this is making me want to branch out of my eight o'clock dumb and maybe go to the nine o'clock, maybe check out the 10, 30, 11 o'clock service. But we are a thoughtful group. We have people who have been at St. Paul's all their life. And then you have newbies like me and another one of our members, but we are very prudent. We're very disciplined in our approach to this. Very grateful to Barbara Abbott. She is a great shepherd, a great coach to keep us on track. And I feel um, when led by the spirit, we will know who to present to the vestry. We got some good folks. Plus, by the way, we're using social media. I can't tell you how many YouTube sermons I've listened to delving into where these churches are, the background of the churches. Um, and to St. Paul's effect, if someone goes to our website, they're gonna be looking for certain things from us. Uh, and we can talk about that at some point in the future, but you know, a church's um, photographs talk about who worships there, how welcoming, how diverse it is. So yeah. Yeah, we're a good group of people and I'm part, I'm very happy to be a part of that team. And, and those candidates are gonna be checking out these clergy conversations to get up close to uh, our people, right? These are, these are very important because it's not just us getting to know each other in the congregation, but it's putting out there who we are as a community. Absolutely, and see, we forget that. We think we are the interviewers, we are the be all and end all of the, of the great folks to do discernment. Like any, any job applicant, it's like, yeah, St. Paul seems like a good place. Is it good for me though? And that's what those interviews do as well. Uh, the people that we've interviewed thus far have asked us some tough questions. Each of them has read our parish profile. And I will say, we're gonna be reading that again this week in preparation for this Tuesday's uh, meeting. But I feel we've been truthful about who we are and what we aspire to be. Mm, that's that's great. It's a great profile. I, I mean, a lot of work went into that. John Rollins and mm -hmm. everybody responded to the questionnaire and it's beautifully presented. So it it really does show uh, St. Paul's well. What, what about you personally? What are you looking for? What qualities in a person, a man or a woman that you are looking for in the next rector? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm a pretty extroverted person. The new rector does not have to be an extrovert like me, but I would hope this person is a good listener um, on, at a macro level from the voice of the congregation, but also a good listener for people uh, who may approach him or her on a personal level. Looking some, to someone who can, can lead us from, um, I say a, a um, administrative managerial perspective you know, this is a, a, a business, so to speak. I mean, there are a lot of components about, quote, running a church from the finances, the plant, the property, all of that, that require oversight. And I'm looking for someone who is a good overseer, looking for someone who will empower us, however, as congregants to do our thing and to serve in our best capacity. Um, I'll never forget one of my managers says, look, my job is not to do your job, but to remove barriers so that you can be successful. I'm looking for a leader, but I'm also looking for someone who will empower us. You have to have a sense of humor because if you're tight, I'm not going to be liking you at all. You need to have a sense of humor. And I'm hoping to hear that from you over the pulpit and in one-on-one -on -one conversations or in group settings. So finally, that leads me we are here 
or at least I come to church to hear the gospel. I need to be fed spiritually. So I'm hoping he or she will be a good preacher and that they preach from scripture. If you start rambling and going off topic, you're going to lose me. So I'm looking to have someone who is grounded in the word and who can build out a thesis that will feed us every Sunday and in the middle of the week if we have services. So it's a tall order, tall order. Yeah, and with COVID, it's a challenge for you, the search committee, for uh, the candidates to be able to kind of engage um, during this really difficult time. But um, mm -hmm. but good, good for you for pushing forward. Yeah, and I think one thing, Albert, we have to realize no one is perfect. There was only one person who was perfect, and he died for us, gave us salvation, and gave us that lovely connection with God the Father. So nobody's perfect. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So tell me, so this has been one hell of a year in not just with COVID, but looking at race relations in this country. And we look at um, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna yeah. Taylor, and just all of the, all of the pain. So kind of where are you with all of that um, as you, as you sit and, um, uh, new, we've got a new administration, yeah. we've got lots of challenges ahead, but just where, I'd love to hear just what your perspective on all this. So when all this was going on, and by the way, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, this is not new news. This has been happening since the first slave ship arrived on American soil in 1619. This is not new news. I think back to, and I wasn't born then, but it, yeah, I might've been a baby, but Emmett Till, 14 year old from Chicago visiting relatives, didn't understand the rules of the road and the rules of Jim Crow South, beat that boy to death. So this is not new news, it's ever present. So there came a point after all of this social unrest where I just couldn't talk anymore. I couldn't talk to my black friends. I couldn't talk to my white friends, I'm done because the weight of history has always been on my shoulder. And it really is on every black person's shoulder. When a baby is born with brown skin in America, that baby has weight based on history of what has happened um, with this country. So I couldn't talk for a minute, partly because of rage, partly because of sheer fatigue of seeing and hearing the same atrocities happen over and over again. So I got better, I got better. And I, I realized, and I started thinking because I knew you were gonna ask me this question. It's like, well, what changed for me? Well, looking back at those folks behind me, they might've been tired, my relatives, my ancestors, but they never gave up and they never stopped pressing forward. So who am I to say, I'm gonna sit still and sit on the side? Can't do it, can't do it. You know, um, one of my favorite scriptures is Galatians 6. It says, uh, do not grow weary in well-doing for in due season you will reap if you faint not. So you got to press forward. And that's how I feel. And that's what I feel my responsibility is. Don't know what it'll look like, but, you know, perhaps this conversation with you is a measure of being engaged. Yeah, I, you know, I know the diocese is trying to create resources and uh, for people, particularly white churches, to start mm -hmm. talking about the systemic racism. And mm -hmm. it's really difficult because no white person wants to kind of own that they're racist, right? Yeah. And yeah. I remember when I was, um, when I was looking way back in the mid 80s, it was very difficult as a gay priest to find work. And I remember George Regas, who was my rector in All Saints, he finally hired me, but he took three months to make a decision because he was going to get pushback from the uh -huh. congregation. And I remember saying to George, you know, George, I'm homophobic too, right? I've heard all the things said about me, and I have to figure them out quickly because it's about me. And I just saw this great burden being lifted off his shoulders that he hadn't thought of that that we're all homophobic in the same way that we're sure. all kind of, we're all dealing with sexism, 
and racism, and it allowed him to kind of al allow his own processes. So what what kind of what can we do as a congregation, a largely white congregation that really longs for to be diverse, but we're just having a hard time getting there. Let me tell you, I'm just thinking about this now. For me, I'm I am always concerned about offending people. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want anyone to be upset because I have to work with them, or I don't want anyone to be upset at St. Paul's because I have to. I want to worship with them openly. I don't want to offend. I simply want to feel and to know from you as one of my Caucasian brothers that I can speak truthfully to you and share things um, that are on my heart and that are born of my experience. I have to be able to tell you what I think and what I feel and what I've seen. And I am often reticent to share stuff just for fear that people will shut down because they can't take the information in, they can't process it. So I, I, I want that to be removed and say, tell me what you think. You know, tell me what you think about the Amy Cooper bird watcher situation with the Harvard educated ornithologist. I got words for you. I'm not gonna give them to you now, but I have words. Amy Cooper is not an anomaly. She's not. So I just wanna have permission and freedom to speak. And you can take what I say or not take it. And I will give you that same grace to let me know how you feel. Everything is born of conversation and understanding, right? Mm -hmm. This can be partly an academic process. You can read stuff. The best thing to make it personal is to engage. Yep, right. And find a comfort level and a safety level where it's okay, and I and I I can see there are wonderful resources right now between now and July. Um, even our local deanery, the local Episcopal churches, mm -hmm. are starting to talk about this. Uh, in happenings this week, I I quoted Jared um, uh, from St. Martin's, the priest. Yes. Did you see that piece? Where I did he's see that. He's talking about the racism, the historic racism and classism in St. Martin's. Yeah, that was pretty phenomenal. I think, what is it, Buttercup Cottage? It's like, what are you talking about? You know, this, this whole segmentation by class and status. So, you know, that's a broad conversation. So I think, that, you know, cast, I started reading the book. So you have the whole notion of caste versus race. Sometimes they, they merge, sometimes they don't. But yeah, yeah, I did read that. Yeah, no, I think there's some really good things happening, but we, we could do more. Certainly do more. Mm -hmm. So we're about to come into Lent. Okay. Can you talk yep. a little bit about what some of your practices are and maybe what some people give things up and some people take things on? How, how I mean, Lent is a really good time for the church to do some deep reflection about some of the things we've talked about this morning. But I want to get your perspective on it. All right. First of all, I'm going to fess up. I flunk every Lent. I flunk at Lent. I start out at the beginning of Lent and this is what we're going to do. And something happens where I may have a little something where I don't do what I'm gonna do, but you know, it's, it's, it's a very thoughtful time. It's a very thoughtful time. Um, I look back when I was a little girl, we had something called a mite box, M-I-G-H-T box. And you would put a nickel or a penny in there um, I think, I forget how it worked either. If you didn't hold to your Lenten discipline or, or what have you, but yeah, we would put money in the box and give it at the end around Easter time. But um, this is different. We're in pandemic, we're in COVID here. And this might give me an opportunity and I'm going to make it an opportunity for me to <sighs> sit still amidst the chaos because I need to do that. There's chaos in the world, politically, otherwise, vaccine, I, I wanna sit still. So I'm going to leverage St. Paul and what we do during this Lenten season. I'm going to work very hard to do this for me, not for the fact that I'm a good Episcopalian or I'm trying to be one, but for me, because I need something during this season, Albert, I'm telling you. You know, I feel like I'm always running on empty and I have just enough to get me through the day sometimes. Perhaps during this Lenten season, what we do as a church can feed my soul and get me to springtime and Resurrection Sunday. 
I think that's a great place to end. Denise, thank you so much for yep. uh, for who you are and for the gifts you bring to the world and the church and in St. Paul's. We're we're very blessed and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Yep. Uh, people can uh, now uh, join us for a Q and A um, at. Uh, it's going to be. It's probably about eleven thirty by now. So come and come and come and ask some more questions and get to know uh, Denise, um, our wonderful sister in Christ. God bless. We we covered a lot of ground. I'll tell you, we covered a lot of ground, and it and it was a lovely, you know, it complemented the liturgy and Father. Daryl's sermon this morning, and I just thought it was really perfect timing for you to share and advocate for the eight o'clockers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is great. I'm so happy to have whoever it is join. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, today's service was really good. I'll tell you that much. I tend to be a note taker. And um, Reverend Tiller said some good things, not only about the history of Absalom, uh, Absalom Jones, but just about, you know, who we are. He said, we're a highly favored country, which I found amazing given the days and times in which we live. But anyway, yeah. yeah, yeah, but we are, but you know, outside of that, we're a highly favored people, you know, we are God, so. That's a good thing to know that I'm favored. <laughs> so what can I do? How can I help anyone? I'm, I'm happy to chat. I see Miss Charlotte there. Miss Charlotte is faithful. I've seen you there before. Oh, yes. I'm glad to finally sort of get to know you. We pass in the uh, driveway often on the mornings, you going home and not me just coming. <laughs> yeah. Well, the eight o'clock group is a, it's, where are we all going? What service, I mean, there's only one service now, but uh, are we gonna, when we get back to uh, live services, are we gonna, are we gonna scooch in a, more than just the nine o'clock? I, you know, the joke is we're gonna burn that bridge when we're standing on it. <laughs> Fair. Fair answer. <laughs> so I think you said what? Now and we start next week at nine o'clock. Is that right, Albert? Yeah. So we're going to ease back in. We're we're moving out of virtual only to nine o'clock. Actually, Ash Wednesday will be our first Sunday yeah. for people back in church, at, and we'll do a spoken service at twelve. Denise, there you are. You like the spoken word, mm -hmm. and then. We'll do a seven o'clock choral Eucharist and people can administer, you know, if they pick up the ashes, Tuesday, Wednesday, they can self-administer the ashes. So we're trying to be creative about that. Cause I know that that's a very meaningful service for a lot of people, a very kind of, you know, grounding in our, in our humanity and in our, tra in our transients. How do we, mm -hmm. how do we make the best of the time we have on earth? Right. And, um, and then uh, the following Sunday, we're going to start with in person at nine o'clock. So we'll do 25 people will we'll register. And then I'm hoping we, you know, as long as uh, COVID and we, we, we keep doing the right things that we can journey to Palm Sunday and we're going to do an outdoor service Palm Sunday with a tent. So a lot of people can come and then Holy Week and then Easter we're going to do outside. And then I'm hoping after Easter, we can get back to the normal eight o'clock, nine o'clock and 11. Mm -hmm. So it's usually meant to kind of get back in and allowing those numbers to come down again. And we figure out what's happening with um, these variant strains of the disease, you know? So, but I think we're doing, I think we're doing the best we can. But anyway, let's get back to Denise because there was something you said that really touched me about every brown baby that is born carries this history this burden and i just i thought that was really profound yeah um that's how i feel i mean and, and it is true i um <laughs> skin color is something you can't walk away from right um you know the whole notion of being able to move up socioeconomically that is something that can be accomplished 
you know, by various means, education, family lineage, what have you, but I can't erase what color I am. There's nothing I can do about that. And, um, you know, my parents were both educators. I'm an only child. People would say I'm spoiled. I prefer to say I'm privileged, but they gave me a fantastic education. I attended a four-year prep school. I'm an Ivy League girl. Um, my parents did very well by me uh, on that front. But regardless of where I work, regardless of my education level, at the end of the day, the first thing people see is my skin tone. And, you know, that is where assumptions start to begin. So yeah, little babies, you know, they come in and they have history on their weight, on, 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 their, little, on their little souls and bodies. And, you know, they do. And I just kind of feel that way. It's my thought. This is a, this is a strange question maybe, uh -huh. but I think the fact that Obama was our president for eight years, I think it ripped scabs off some people, am I right? And that some of what went on during the period following the Obama years with the, with the racism and the, the murders by the, by the small minority of cops that shot people mm -hmm. because they were brown or black. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that if Obama had never been president, we'd still be hiding some of this stuff. Is, is, is there any truth to that? That's just that's just dumb, one dumb old reporter's view of what's happened and uh, that maybe we're being more honest now than we were 10 years ago or 15 years ago, mm -hmm. as awful as that is. Yeah. Is there any truth to that? Do you see that from your side of the divide? Um, I don't mean that in a negative way. Oh, I understand. I understand. I, I, I will say that there is a history American history. I thought about this a lot. You know, you know, this is quote Black History Month. Listen, Black history is American history, Asian American history, and all these months of history that we celebrate. It's all Americans, America. You know, this is our history as a country. Um, yeah, there's a lot of hidden stuff uh, that became more exposed. You know, after Obama became president, um, the whole notion of Ugliness coming 11, out with the first, 13, you know, the first 14. black this, the first black that. I thought back to um, Brown versus Board of Education. Those those kids, those kids were high school kids who were integrating a school. They were firsts, and you saw. I mean, we all remember images of them walking that gauntlet of hatred. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. So scabs have been ripped off, I think, throughout our history. Uh, and yeah, Obama was just another affectation of, you know, the underbelly of America based on race coming to the fore. And again, yeah, these are my thoughts. Yeah, these yeah, are just my and thoughts. I just, I just think that when, when Trump became president and started ripping, uh, started doing all the racist things that he, that he did, uh, that there were people who were thinking, gee, here I am, a white American, and this black guy was just president, and I'm no better off now than I was when he was, you know, when W was president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you some questions. I mean, I see Fred. I've seen Fred's beard before. Hey, Fred. Um, Hi, Denise. <laughs> I see Van, and I see Wendy Munyon's picture, and there's Pam. So I'm going to ask you guys, because I'm on the search committee and, um, you know, it's good for me to hear as, as one of your fellow, fellow parishioners, but also as someone who's looking for a, a new pastor or a new minister, tell me your thoughts. Um, yes, you are at St. Paul's, but you're also citizens of the world and citizens of this country. Where do you think we are? And... Um, how do you think that applies to who we might want to be as a church? Well, Denise, thank you. And I just want to say I so much appreciated uh, the conversation you had with, with Albert because it touched on so many things, um, but especially what you said about being given permission to be you know, who you are, 
where you are, what you have to say in a safety, in a safe environment that would be respectful, that would listen and vice versa. Um, because that was a struggle that I have had um, over these years at St. Paul's, mm. about being willing to say what I saw, what I felt, and the times that I did, um, I saw some improvement in terms of diversity, uh, particularly sure. when I brought Manny on board. That was really significant for me because there had been a number of uh, parish hall meetings and annual meetings where after having been on the vestry had said that was something that I would like to see happen, that there'd be yeah. more representation. Um, and it did begin to happen. But what I would like to see is someone who would really help us. And like you said, remove those barriers that we have around conversation, around the honesty and openness that would allow us to be a church mm -hmm. that would um, not just say we want to be diverse, but do things that make it open, make mm -hmm. space yeah. uh, in our music, mm -hmm. in the worship we have, in who comes and worships with us. So, so yeah. having a leader in our, in our next rector that would be willing to do that. Great, thank you, thank you. Anybody else have any thoughts? One thing that I couldn't have agreed with you more about is that if our next rector doesn't have a, have a sense of humor, he or she's gonna end up swallowing their gun in about 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, wow, I, I tell you, there's a, there's a lot to it. Um, there's yeah. a lot to look for any quote good candidate you know, regardless of, of what the position is, but specifically in this one, this line of quote work, spiritual work, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. What else guys, what else? I'm listening to you and I need to learn from you as much as I was yakking. I sounded, uh, you know, I was, I was yakking. I definitely was talking. So, you know, what can you tell me about you and your thoughts? So the next time I see you face to face, I can know you a little bit better. Denise, um, I'm on the outreach committee and um, you talked about community engagement and I'm wondering if there are suggestions that you have for sort of deepening our, our outreach into the community. Uh, and thanks Wendy for the question. You know, I, I don't have anything top of mind. Um, you know, we're doing some things now. I feel that, you know, it's, it's interesting where we are. We're at the top of this hill. There are other churches in the area and we're all trying to, I think, do our best with respect to broadening our reach um, and having meaningful impact. I think if you just look at some, some basic things, you know, is it hunger? Are we trying to deal with hunger? Are we dealing with homelessness? Are we dealing with inequity around education? Uh, perhaps if we hone in on a specific area that interests us as a congregation, that might help us to better find how we can make an impact and partner with others um, in the broader community. I mean, Germantown is right down the road. It's very interesting. I'm up here uh, off of Gallon Street. And if you go four blocks, you're hitting hardcore black neighborhood. It's all black from let's say Mount Pleasant on down towards um, Broad Street. And there are, I'm sure there are many other organizations, people, nonprofits, nonprofits with whom we can partner to accomplish what we might hone in on as a congregation. So it's, 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 it's a kind of a rambling um, answer, but there's so much need and perhaps we need to find out the need that suits us or the need that we want to uh, attack first. Doesn't mean we stop. If it's homelessness now, perhaps it's something in another few years, but yeah. What are your thoughts? I think, well, I think outreach is a way uh, that we can get to work with younger people. And that's a really important thing for us right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to agree with you there. You know, the generations are coming up. Um, yes, you know, you, by the time you get to my age, you get a little crust on you, you get a little bit crusty, set in your ways. I'm still always willing to learn 
uh, and there is a flexibility in, in who I am, but I think if we start to engage younger folk uh, in a meaningful way, it will help us overall uh, and in a very long run as a society. So I am with you there. And I don't think we're quite as blind as some people think, because it was very interesting last week, the last thing that the former presiding bishop, Frank Griswold said was how much he and his wife who is on the vestry appreciates all the work we're doing with St. Luke's in Germantown, mm -hmm. which is a black parish, yep. primarily. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, I think that's a good, you know, it, it may only be a step, but it's a good step. And for I think. to recognize it is, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I think, Denise, as you said, about focusing in and honing um, <laughs> what we do in outreach, and I think of uh, the work with face-to-face -face, um, yep. and um, whosoever, um, gospel mission, mm -hmm. and, uh, interfaith hospitality. And it, yes. it seems mostly focused around homelessness, um, but certainly that is very important to be able to have impact. Um, mm -hmm. so, and I think St. Paul's has done that um, over the years, at least that I've been there. Yeah, and and I mean, you are all have been there longer than I. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm new, you know, only two years, um, but I have seen things and, you know, I wasn't even attending regularly, but I do remember every Martin Luther King Day, we would have that food bagging situation going on down in the in the rectory. You know, we were making meals and bagging them. I don't know how many hundreds we did, but that was a very nice way for us to come together uh, as, a, as a community and do something um, that is meaningful and will help others. So I enjoyed that and I can't wait for us to, to get back together so we can start um, thinking of more creative ways, you know, in which to engage the community and to do some good. And we're still doing that in, with the shop and drop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so Janice, I want to I, I want to link what before. you're talking about with. Uh, I mean, it's, it was interesting growing up in Northern Ireland, where you had <laughs> um, we we didn't have so much uh, problems around race, but we had problems around religion. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it was a deep suspicion and fear of the other, whether you were Protestant or Catholic. And, and some of us, we had friends and some, many people in Northern had relatives who were from the other side, right? But there was this deep sectarianism, this kind of, this ghost in the machine that we, we could be friends and we could love our neighbors and mm -hmm. do all the kind of things that, you know, St. Paul's is doing now, but the institutions did our dirty work for us, kept us divided, kept yep. us demeaned, right? Less than. I see the same a parallel in racism. How can we as an institution, a significant institution, 160 year old institution in this area, do more to look at the systemic stuff? Because I think, again, we're, we're doing all that good work that we've just talked about. I agree in that thing. But the systemic stuff, uh, there's still a reluctance on the part of our lay leadership in the parish to start to engage some of the processes of looking at the systemic stuff. And it's, and it's again, we said on the interview, nobody wants to be accused of being a racist. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? How do we start that difficult, maybe scary conversation? So again, I'm gonna look for everyone else to answer as well because this is a conversation, but, um, and this may not answer your question so much. You know, I think one way to begin is to have a forgiving heart. Number one, just have a forgiving heart and an, an open heart. The other is to realize that everybody has biases. I definitely have them. Everyone has biases. So I, I feel that when we talk about race, Caucasians think black folks are pointing the finger at them in a very accusatory way. And that's not the case. And well, take it back. I'm backtracking, <laughs> I'm backpedaling, <laughs> even as we speak. In some instances, that is the case, but we all have biases every last one of us. And if we can start a conversation understanding that each of us has biases, I think that would be a great foundation. 
um, I'm not here to accuse you all of anything. Neither are you going to engage me pointing fingers and saying, see, you're all alike. You all think this way. You all think that we're bad, horrible people. That's not the, that's not it. We're not, this is not what this is about. It's just about, again, unburdening your souls and your hearts and being willing to speak truths, regardless of how they may land on the listener's ears. Um, you just got to be honest. Just be honest. And listen, I think we internalize and personalize things so much. We take it personally. Just be willing to listen a bit and perhaps set the biases, set the fear aside and say, okay, I can see that. I may agree, I may not, but I understand. This is hard work. And quite frankly, not a lot of people wanna do it. It's hard, hard work. And when you think about your lives, your families, your kids, your jobs, your health, pandemic, getting a vaccine, I don't feel like doing the work. I will do the work later. And I understand if that's where you are and you say, I can't do it now. But at some point we have to make time to be able to do it. One kind of reasonable place to start would be having a conversation about how if you grew up white in America, you kind of can't help but have stuff built in that you need to work to get around. And just, um, just that kind of basic understanding that, that of course you have racist ideas that are, have been part of you forever and ever, but let's, kind of figure out ways that we can work to get beyond them. I don't mm -hmm. know, there's lots and lots of books out there that right. are really good at pointing that out. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, just having a, a, a skilled leader um, kind of just take us through a lot of that might be a foundation because then you understand that, mm -hmm. that it's not just you, you're not a terrible person for having these ideas. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's built into everything around us. Right. And we all need to work at fixing it. So um, I work at Vanguard. I've been at Vanguard 21 years. I'm a relationship manager now and I deal with a lot of colleges and universities that use our mutual funds in their retirement plan. But at one point I was in Vanguard's corporate diversity office. And the mission was to create not only a, a more diverse organization, but just to bring about a consciousness in the workplace that would ensure that everyone had the right opportunities to proceed uh, from a career development standpoint. But what I learned and one thing we would tell people about speaking of these issues, we always talk about differences, you know, and we're gonna talk about differences and, and, and differences. And maybe that is not what we need to be talking about. Perhaps the dialogue should be more about similarities. And in talking about similarities amongst people, that is a gentler, but as effective way to start talking about those things um, that may separate us, those biases. Because I think we would probably have more in common then not. I think our similarities may um, be more significant than our differences. So this whole notion about differences, I think that's something that we can talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot about my fellow parishioners and I found some similarities with my folks on the, on the committee. Three of us are from Mississippi. Who knew? I didn't know that. So by understanding similarities, it's, it's, it's a nice way to embrace and be willing to have the difficult conversations. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the things um, where I work uh, in the federal government and many times when we would have team building exercises and we talk about also the diversity aspect, one of the things that always resonated with me is that we started talking about the commonality among us and as we started doing that, 
that opened the door for more dialogue about, well, what are some of the differences? But first we talked about how we were connected. And I think that, that helped to bring an environment with a little more trust and a little more willingness to be vulnerable because, oh, I have something that connects me with my colleagues here. And sometimes it's, it has been around a tragedy, a loss of a family member at a young age and someone else says all the same thing. But clearly it was a way of opening up that dialogue. And the other thing I wanted to put in real quickly, we are connected in terms of my family's from Mississippi, uh, Jackson, Jackson, yep. Mississippi. Um, and I always go down there every couple of years because we have family reunions and we have anywhere from 150 to 200 folks and then we do it around the country. So Philadelphia is the next time we're gonna be doing it. Hopefully. Oh, good. Oh, when you do it again, can I come please? Yeah, I'll be your, I'll oh, be your cousin for sure. by another family member. I'll come for to the sure. family reunion. <laughs> you never know, you know. And then I grew up in Connecticut and Where? New London, New Britain, New London and New Britain. Yep, I was a Milford, Connecticut girl, Long Island Sound, and yep. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. see, this is so. what we're saying in oh, real life yeah. action. So there we go, similarities. Yep. It's a yep. wonderful exactly. thing. I didn't know that. Yep, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm far from having this worked out in my mind, but um, it just seems to me one of our problems at St. Paul's, and it's not an easy one to overcome, uh, but we don't as a group, as a parish worship together mm. and there's a basic trust sort of just gets gradually built in worshiping with the same folks over and over again and um i've been around long enough that i can remember when i thought i knew everybody in the parish and everybody in the parish knew me and now i'd say no, 50%. I don't know them at all. Mm -hmm. And nor do they know me. <laughs> and uh, that's, it, it's very hard to accomplish things together when you don't know people. Sure. Sure. So thank you very much for that comment, Charlotte. And I will tell you, um, uh, you know, from a search committee perspective, and I don't believe I'm, I'm divulging anything I should not, you know, that is something that has, it was in our parish profile, partly that we have three different um, services right. and we worship in silos to a certain degree. And what we've heard from a few of the um, people with whom we've spoken is that the notion of worship today in 2021 it, we may never have that feeling that you're saying you miss. So the challenge and the opportunity for a new rector would be to discover and identify ways in which we can come together as community outside of um, a Sunday service, because we may never um, come together as we did in the past. So how do we do that? <laughs> One of the applicants talked about, he says, well, Food is always something that is great to bring people together, have food and they will come. So we're talking about ways we can do this. Now, granted, rummage is chaos unto itself, but sure enough, people would come together. And I met folks the first rummage I worked. And it's like, well, who are you? I'm at the eight o'clock service. And you know, I was paired with someone, you know, running money back and forth. It sounds like, you know, graft, but no, it's not it's for the church. Um, but yeah, you meet people with other activities and it's going to be up to that new person to help us identify ways to come together as community outside of these distinct services because it may never happen again. And finally, the person mentioned technology. There are some people who will probably always want to stream in to St. Paul's. And the notion of who we are as a community, we may have quote parishioners who are not even in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania, they may be other places. Because I will share that during this pandemic, I've quote gone to other churches that are nowhere near Pennsylvania, but I've just gone there just to see 
how other folks are worshiping and what they're saying during these times. So, yeah. Did, are you sad about that though, Charlotte? Are you saddened? To some degree, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I appreciate that. And what I will say and what I've learned you know, through the search committee, it's like, look, you need to go to the nine o'clock service if you want to know these people. You're working with a few nine, nine thirty um, family folks on this committee, and you like them. Why would you not want to go maybe one Sunday a month to the nine thirty service with the kids? I don't want to be their old cur curmudgeon woman, not willing to go hang out with kids and worship. So go. Um, My answer to that though would be it conflicts with my primary. Um, mission at St. Paul's, which is adult education. Yes. It doesn't anymore though, Charlotte, because we changed it on purpose. Right. Where we moved the 1030 service to 11. So we haven't, we haven't had a chance yet to- uh, No, no. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's right. But I mean, th that was the reason to do it, to allow people to go to the nine o'clock service and go to adult education as well. So, you know, it's, uh, oh man, you know, flexibility is required of us all. <laughs> and uh, Wendy talked about outreach and I'm talking to myself now. It would behoove me to do my personal outreach within my family church as well. So I'm hearing you and I'm talking to myself saying I have a role as well to do my internal outreach within our community, to get to know people better, to extend myself and to just, you know, go outside of this boundary I've constructed. Albert interview, interviewed me as an eight o'clock or yes, I'm an eight o'clock, but I can do a lot better by going to other services as well, getting to know my folks, um, you know, who worship at different services. So I'll do my part. I commit to doing my part. I found that uh, I started out as a um, 1030 and uh -huh. then I went to the nine o'clock um, because we were raising Andre and uh -huh. got involved with parents exchange. And then as Andre was in high school and was confirmed and it always happens, you know, stop, he stopped going to church as much started going back to the 1030 because that's where Steven sings it on, on the choir. Yeah. So I've had the opportunity to go and be part of all three services and every one of them had something special for me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it was part of meeting me where I was at the time as well. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the eight o'clock, it was something that I needed for a while to be yeah. contemplative, to be mm -hmm. quiet. Uh, you would also do see, both services. To see Clark, to see Clark, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no, that's, that, that's a hell of a reason. But, uh, <laughs> but then you go to the 11 or within the 1030 because you had to take pictures. So you, yeah. you yeah. would get an opportunity by what you do as a volunteer and do so well, you get a chance to see more than just one right. service, which right. the rest of us don't have that same kind of draw. And I think that Denise is right. We should probably, we should probably wander around and go to all the services if we can, mm -hmm. particularly those so, of us who are on the vestry or who are in in on the stewardship committee or search committee or whatever. So I do have a question for you, and I'm looking at Albert's eyes, and he's going to be wrapping this up at some point. So I'm gonna, like, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, you're getting out the hook, Albert. Are you going to get out the hook or what? <laughs> <laughs> so oh. I do have a question for you and it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to you all. So tell me what you're hopeful for. I want to hear words of goodness and light and love because I personally need it today. So tell me, what are you hoping for and what do and and, and of what do you feel most hopeful for with respect to St. Paul's? So the Kimberleys have joined us. I think they should they should have the first uh, right of the floor. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Albert and and Denise. Uh, the audio part of this works fine. The video part is frozen, so it, it doesn't. If you look at the screen, it doesn't look like I'm talking. But if if you can hear me, um, yep. I know that I am. So I just have I just have one thing to say. Um, 
Barbie and I joined late uh, because I was uh, doing something else at 11 o'clock when uh, the interview that you had with Albert was, was played. Um, but I wanted to watch that. So the reason I joined this uh, session late was because I wanted to hear the um, conversation between you and Albert. And one thing, I, I've got lots of reactions, which I'd love to share with you at some point, you know, offline, but sure. the, the one thing that I can say, uh, and, and with, with, with deep gratitude is, I am really glad you are on the search committee. I think that is fantastic. I think Paul, St. Paul's is incredibly well served by the whole committee, but listening to your story and listening to your journey as an Episcopalian, which started young <laughs> and, and has, has been longstanding. I mean, that was really inspirational. And so I'm, uh, I'm just thrilled that you're a part of the committee um, and, and looking forward to, uh, obviously as we all are, to the results of that search process. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to have coffee with you once we're back in the church and I'm, I'm always happy to, um, to speak with, with folks. You know, I am looking quite as it's kept to build a family. Um, all of my relatives are in the South. My cousins and I, we are the elders now. All of our parents are gone. My mom and dad are gone. Everyone is gone. So we are the elders and I'm up here and the relatives are down there. So, you know, the notion of family need not only be by blood, but it can also be by the spirit. So I'm looking forward to knowing you all a little bit better. Well, and so I do have a question for you on that. In yep. that regard, how did we get to be elders so quickly? <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes, I don't know. Listen, I am still 35 in heart, but it is something else. So, you know, I'm, I'm 66 years old and I mean, we've all been through this drama, maybe not banned yet, but I started getting papered with Medicare information when I was 64 and a half. And I'm thinking this cannot be addressed to me. You have got to be kidding me. But um, yeah, time goes so quickly. It just goes so quickly. And that's why it's so precious now and we have to use it wisely. Hey, oh, you're such a young I'm, I'm a 49er. Oh so. my goodness. So there you have. 43. <laughs> no, I, I, oh, oh, really Clark? Yeah. All right. 78. Mm -hmm. and so what are everybody else's hopes? What is everybody else thinking? What are your hopes for us? I'm just hoping we can get some new younger folks involved and find yeah. ways that we can um, really reach out to the community in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Wendy, I mean, I don't, I don't have children, um, but I will say young folks these days seem to have an enlightenment that I perhaps did not have when I was, let's say, um, you know, a tween or a teen, the whole notion of, you know, social media, I think has played a significant impact on information and accessibility. And I will also say most communities and school systems, be they private or public have gotten better at telling history as it really is. And I, I can't go down that whole path, you know, the path of revisionism, but there's stuff I just didn't learn when I was in school mm -hmm. that I think younger folks are learning. And so the fact that their minds are open and if we can get them into our fold, I think, and I agree that we will be better served for the future. So I'm agreeing with you. Charlotte, you were going to share some your, your, your point of view of hope? Well, it's just, I, oh, I get this nagging sense sometimes that um, outreach is a very good thing, uh, but outreach, that we have to, we have to do it knowing we're doing it um, as, as part of the church, not 
not good works that we could do in some other mm -hmm. yeah. capacity. Uh, I think when it has when it has our faith behind it, it's empowered in a way that it wouldn't be otherwise. And, but I'm not expressing this very well, but it's just something that I I constantly feel I'm torn uh, about this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charlotte. Fred, anything you want to contribute? I'm just hopeful to just see some more people in the pews, whether it's eight o'clock service, nine o'clock, 1030. Um, just all that uh, all that's going on at St. Paul's, I just think it's just just wonderful for a place for people to get involved in some way. Mm -hmm. And then also just to see more participation from our current members in all the programs that we're that we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. How many people are involved in this Zoom call? Where 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 is everybody? I, I I'm just let me just scratch my head like. Come on, participate. You gotta do gotta do something. Mm -hmm. Gotta show up. So I just well, want to say what what sometimes happens is people watch it later. Like last week with Frank Griswold, we had over a hundred views. So just because people aren't on this now doesn't mean to say they're not gonna watch it. That's one of the downsides of technology. Or the upside, maybe. So I'll tell you, Albert, I saw 16 people watching. It's like, thank the Lord, I got a strong constitution. I said, that's it? 16 people? It's like, what have I done? But, um, you know, I appreciate the 16 who did watch it in real time. So that's a good thing. So Pam, would you like to share your hopes for St. Paul's, uh, your blessings, future? Well, I, I, I hope I won't crash here. Uh, I'm hoping that the conversation that Denise had is the same conversation I have about telling the truth and about St. Paul's being, I still say, is perceived as a white church. And we have to figure out a way of changing that. But I think if we start with small groups and allow ourselves to really talk about our, our likenesses, for lack of a word, as opposed to differences. Talk about how we're alike. I mean, I've talked to several persons that we realized some of our childhoods were so, so similar. So I think if we begin to do that and break down the walls, but it's gonna take a while because no one really has wanted to talk about this. This is the piece that I think the wall is there and individuals have just said, well, we come to church and I don't wanna get into the politics. I don't wanna get involved in that. But we live in this reality, and this reality is we need to be dealing with some of the things that are not really right. They're not Christian. They're not God-like. So we need to really talk about that. How can we change it without, and we're going to offend some people. And if we start talking about this, we know that some people will take their checkbook, their money, and they will walk. But if, if that's what is needed, to make St. Paul's what we are saying we want it to be, then that's what we have to do, I do believe. That's well said, Tom. Thanks so much. Clark. Yes. Blessings, hopes for the future. Well, one of the things, I'm a little bit more optimistic with the long-term view. I can remember the days uh, not so long ago when Van was the only black face in the past. And now there are many, many more, thank God. And they are Pam and Denise and they were Arthur Stokes and uh, Charlotte, I mean, and uh, Marion and Oscar. Yeah. I think we're making progress, but it's very slowly. But I don't think you can force the issue. Uh -huh. I think it has to grow on its own. And I think having Denise and Pam and Van 
and these other people of color who are part of our really major parts of our family now is going to attract other people to St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that. It worked with the gay community back in the early part of the yeah. century. I think it will too. I, I just, I have to believe that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Any other uh, final comments? We are going to wind up and Denise, you've <laughs> You've uh, given us a lot of your time and thought, and I think you are a, a great sign of hope and and uh, courage. And uh, there, I think St. Paul's is blessed to have you. And I think anybody coming in, uh, any new priest coming in, I think it's going to be exciting to kind of weave together the energy and the commitment of the people that we have and to make it um, somehow more engaged. Just as St. Martin's and St. St. Thomas's right now, I mean, we're, we're in this corner of this city and community that I think uh, our church is, is really on fire right now. And we're mm -hmm. starting to look at these difficult things. And if, if St. Paul's keeps marching forward, I think it's just gonna be fine. Yeah, and, and, and my final word, and by the way, this is Betty. You saw her on the video. This is Betty. Happy Valentine's Day, my girl. Um, you know, and I, and I, I just want to appeal to people who've been at St. Paul's for some time. You know, we need that long history to go forward. And I hope that people who've been parishioners at St. Paul's for decades understand, you know, what we're, who we're looking for in a rector. We're not trying to erase anything that has brought us to where we are today. History is rich, history matters. So I think that needs to be said. We're not trying to you know, turn this ocean liner called St. Paul's, this ship of faith immediately, but the history is important, but we do need to use it um, to move us to where we hope to, to ultimately get. That's great. So Yay. everybody, thank you so much for uh, sharing and um, happy Valentine's Day. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. Uh, Ash Wednesday coming up and lots of fun things uh, that we're doing together as a parish as we build the body of Christ in this place. Great, so. I appreciate you. God bless you guys. Have a great thank day. You, thank, thank you, Denise. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Denise. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Well.